Hey. Um, so bef just before we start the meeting, um, we've had apologies from Councillor Jones as the chair and Councillor Nesbitt as the vice chair. So the first thing we need to do before we start is to elect a new chair from the members. So is it <laughs> nominations for Councillor Dodd? Yeah. 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 I'll second. Second, yeah. Okay. Need a pen. Right, everybody. Veronica Jones did ask me to be prepared in case she didn't come, and she hasn't. She's not too well, so I didn't know about Kath. So uh, we wish them, or at least Veronica, speedy recovery. So let's crack on with the meeting. Uh, welcome to Health and Wellbeing Overview Scrutiny. Today, Tuesday 4th of April. Apologies. We only have them two apologies. Veronica Chair. Jones, Kath Nesbitt. Nothing from the floor. So I'll move on. Disclosure of members' interests. Anybody? No. Nope. Minutes. Minutes of the previous meeting. Anything on that that anybody would like to bring up that isn't already on the agenda. I don't see anybody. Move, Move acceptance, Chair. Accepted. Forward plan. Chris. Thanks, Chair. Um, there's nothing on the forward plan for this committee. Right. Item five. Let's move on quickly. Mark, hello. Hello there. We, we meet again. We do. Long time. I used to be on the Ambulance Trust. Right. Floor's yours, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. And um, it has been a very long time since I've been glad locked in the building. I think, uh, uh, certainly think before COVID, um, I think the last time I was actually up on the green zooming in. So, uh, it's nice to be back and uh, to see everybody face to face, Jared, to see some familiar faces. I'm here today to talk about our quality account, um, and I'm sorry it's me and um, not Tracy, our Deputy Director of Quality and Patient Safety. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us here today, so um, uh, you are stuck with me. I will take you through the presentation. I will attempt to answer any questions that I can. But what I can't do, I will endeavour to make a note of them and um, come back to you via email with an answer uh, to your question, if I can't answer it today. So the presentation is just going to um, quickly go through the quality report requirement, which I will go through quickly, because I'm sure you're probably familiar with those who have a trust that you, uh, that you receive the quality account from. I'll, I'll talk about our current position and performance. Uh, I'll give an update on our quality priority for the last financial year just gone, and then um, a summary of our proposal for the quality priority for this financial year. And this is all in advance of the um, actual report that you will receive um, uh, in, in, in due course to read. Um, so, uh, as I'm sure you're probably already aware, um, NHS organisations are required to provide um, uh, their quality account, um, our report... Um, or um, have, is shared with commissioners and governors and staff and a health watch board overview of and committee and health and wellbeing board. So this is part of that process of just beginning that, that conversation. Um, we we um, hope to have our uh, quality um, account uh, ready for circulation um, within two weeks' time. So we'll circulate that via your officers here um, uh, to be um, uh, so that you can... Have a look at that um, at your leisure, and I think um, we, we're keeping that open for comment and feedback up until around about um, the third week or last week of May. Uh, so there's a good four, or five, or six weeks there for you to have an opportunity to read through the quality account and to give us your feedback on all of that. And of course, um, our requirement is to have it published on our website by the end of June. So just talking about our performance um, for 22-23 and to, to give you um, um, a, a, 
a health warning around the that the figures that you see on this presentation were um, as of January of 2023, uh, when this presentation was pulled together. And, and obviously the figures that you'll see in our quality report, when we share it with you in a couple of weeks' time, will be for the whole of the financial year. Uh, but you can see there, um, uh, incredibly busy organisation, um, as we always are, um, answering 999 calls and, and 111 calls, um, taking patients to hospital, um, attending incidents, but also treating patients over the phone where we can, um, uh, or treating patients at home, uh, rather than necessarily taking them into uh, an emergency department if that's not the right thing for them to do. Um, our response time performance as of January, uh, you can see there, I've got some figures that take us up to the end of February, um, uh, which, which may or may not help. Uh, but uh, you can see there that uh, we were the fastest responding um, uh, ambulance service for Category 1 calls. And uh, these are calls which are deemed to be uh, potentially life-threatening. Uh, our response is that we should get to a Category 1 call uh, within 15 minutes in 90% of all cases. And you can see on that, um, oh, it looks like the uh, pointer doesn't, uh, doesn't show on the screen, you see in that bottom uh, left-hand um, uh, graph uh, that the uh, North East Ambulance Service is the quickest in that 15-minute target within 90% of the occasion um, at, um, uh, at just, under, uh, just over 12 minutes against the 15-minute standard. And then we're also measured on that target for the average response time to all calls, and that the average response should be seven minutes. You can see there in January we were seven minutes seven, um, still the fastest, although no, no ambulance truck achieved that target in that month. At the end of February, uh, we had that down to six minutes 51, and the only ambulance service to be achieving that particular car, uh, uh, target for responses. Uh, the next category of response is category two. So um, these are still very serious calls. Uh, they may not be potentially life-threatening anymore, but they do contain, uh, they do have in them conditions that uh, do require a quick response. And the response there is that we must get to 90% of these calls within 40 minutes. And uh, you can see there that uh, in January we were doing that in one hour eight, and no ambulance service in the country was achieving that standard. And that's also measured as an average response time for all calls, and we were doing a, a response there in 32 minutes um, in January, and our response uh, average on C2 in February was uh, 29 minutes. So you can see that as we're moving out of those winter pressures that we experienced um, uh, coming up to the end of January, and we're beginning to move into um, uh, a, a more steady state that our response time um, uh, uh, was beginning to improve there. Category 3 calls are less serious. Um, we don't measure the average response time of those calls, only, the, um, only that 90% should be uh, responded to uh, within two hours. In January, we're doing two hours 19 there. Um, again, no ambulance service in the country was achieving that standard. Uh, by the end of February, uh, we were doing one hour seven for against the two hour standard, so we're well within that um, uh, for the uh, uh, for the end of February. And then uh, category four um, calls are those types that still need a patient to be taken to hospital, but they're they're now not being treated as either being life threatening or serious uh, conditions. Uh, you can see there in January uh, the response time is two hours forty one against the. Re against the national standard of three hours, and at the end of February we're doing uh, one hour twelve. So again, a much faster as we move into um, as we move out of those winter pressures. Um, uh, those are our response times. Obviously, there are other indicators that we look at as well, particularly around clinical effectiveness. So it's not just how quickly we can get an ambulance there, but the care that we give the patients when we arrive. So um, those are our ambulance quality indicators. So a return of spontaneous circulation is the measure of someone who has had a cardiac arrest and uh, get a, a pulse uh, back uh, before they arrive into hospital. Uh, that's one of the best, um, although that figure might seem low, um, a cardiac arrest is a very serious condition. That's one of the best standards uh, of ambulance services um, in the country. And you can see there that we also measure the care that our staff give for patients suffering from stroke, septic or, or, or heart attack. 
and that um, though, though standards there again um, uh, compare very favourably uh, when we benchmark um, against others. Um, we recorded 31 serious incidents up until the end of January. That figure will obviously be slightly higher again um, um, as we get to the end of the uh, end of the financial year. And you can see that our patient experience response rates um, are, are, are looking very positive for us. Uh, we survey um, uh, in total probably over 10,000 patients a year. We're the only ambulance service in the country actually to be doing that um, on a consistent level. Uh, but it really helps us to understand uh, better how we can make those service improvements. And, uh, and you can see there, 94% uh, uh, satisfaction rate with our patient transport services, 81% for our 111 call handling, 89% for our uh, um, uh, 999 um, uh, conveyance into hospital, and uh, nearly 97% for those patients with whom um, we send an ambulance, but they don't get taken to hospital and they're treated elsewhere. Just moving on to our quality priority, so we define these by a number of different um, uh, sources. Uh, we look at national performance standards and benchmarking, and also the planning and guidance and priorities that come out, national and local audits that carry out, and also our own strategy and where, uh, where we want to go as an organisation. Uh, an analysis of our incidents and complaints, uh, feedback from patients and groups uh, such as yourself as well, to help determine those priorities and, and also uh, finding from the CQC inspection. So the priorities that we set ourselves um, to achieve for last year were around patient safety, uh, clinical effectiveness and patient experience. And I'll come on to those just to describe um, how, we've, um, how we've progressed with those over the last year. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll come on to how we're going to set our priorities for the beginning of um, for this financial year coming. So, um, in terms of the um, first priority around patient safety, um, uh, we were looking to uh, reduce um, handover delays. So, the standard is that when a patient um, arrives at a hospital, the ambulance should be turned around within 30 minutes and ready to respond at the end. And that time is divided into two parts, 15 minutes for the ambulance service to get the patient off the ambulance and checked into the hospital and the additional 15 minutes after that for the ambulance crew to then restock anything that may need restocking after that patient visit, clean the ambulance if there's anything that needs cleaning after that patient visit before they're ready to, uh, before they're ready to turn around at them. Um, we have seen, um, as is common across the rest of the country, that um, there have been extended um, delays of handover um, uh, to patients at hospitals, particularly over winter. Um, when, when, when hospitals have also uh, struggled themselves with uh, coping with an influx of patients um, uh, that they're having to deal with. Um, we carried out a thematic review, we've looked at areas of good practice and we've also agreed uh, with the system um, an approach now that there should be no handover of the patient uh, that takes um, any longer than uh, 60 minutes. Now that's considerably longer than the um, 15 minutes that is set in the national standard, and that's what we'll always try to achieve. But that 60 minute as, as a maximum zero tolerance approach to handovers um, will mean that we can make significant um, uh, progress in uh, getting our vehicle uh, free to respond to the next call a lot sooner um, than we have been able to over some of the periods of time. And I should just reassure you that, they, um, that the handover um, uh, delays in this part of the world are significantly lower than what, uh, than what they are in other parts of the country. So that's not to say that while this is a problem, uh, we actually have some very good hospitals here um, who, who we work very closely with to keep that problem down to a minimum. And that's something that we're very grateful for our partners. To, uh, to, to do in achieving. So, um, and that's what we will continue to work with them um, in order to reduce those handover delays. So while we have that, that approach for the 60 minute standard, the aim is to get back to that national standard of doing that within, within 15 minutes uh, with hospitals. Um, the other priority was looking at how we learn from incidents. And you can see from the earlier stat, we, we, we reported 31 serious incidents um, up to the end of January. Um, this is something that the CQC has also asked us to focus on. 
Uh, there is a new standard that's coming out nationally, uh, known as the Patient Safety Implement... Oh, sorry, I've forgotten what that stands for. Um, anyone else can remember what PISA stands for? It will come back to me. Thank you very much. Um, it, it's a new way for the NHS to approach managing incidents that really puts the patients and the families at the heart of... Um, um, of that re um, um, of that investigation and learning, um, so we are uh, we've already made um, strides into progressing the implementation um, of that framework um, ourselves, um, in order that um, in, in order that we can be um, uh, one of the early adopters um, um, of the framework uh, later on uh, later on this year. So that work will continue um, into this particular year. In terms of our clinical effectiveness, um, we, um, we did commit over the last year to develop our first contact practitioner workforce. So um, what we found in the last couple of years is that the skills of our paramedic workforce are highly desirable, not just for the ambulance service, but for other parts of the NHS as well. And, and that um, uh, what we wanted to do as an ambulance truck was to offer that career progression for those ambulance staff so that we could keep the paramedics in our organisation but then allow them to support um, other, um, other system partners. So a first contact practitioner will typically work on a three-month rotational basis, spending one month working in GP practices, um, a second month working in a rapid response car um, on the road uh, to us, but responding to those lower acuity cases that didn't necessarily need an ambulance or be transported into hospital, but need much more of that uh, uh, care around um, uh, acute con uh, uh, chronic conditions uh, uh, rather than trauma or acute conditions. And then they'll spend the third month working um, in our emergency operations centre, so supporting the 111 and 999 uh, calls that come in from patients and directing them to the most appropriate care or giving that uh, or, or, or giving that advice um, over the telephone. Um, that's been very successful for us and um, uh, it's allowed our paramedic workforce who are looking for progression in our organisation but don't want to become managers uh, to have a career pathway that allows them that progression um, into, uh, into clinical advancement of their skills. We've also introduced um, a new role of clinical team leader and um, uh, this is to provide um, additional extra support for our staff. As you can imagine, our, our, our workforce work very remotely. They work 24 hours a day and they're dealing with incidents and trauma that occur at any moment of the day. And it's having that support when it's needed that's available for them to be able to, uh, to, be able to support that. And I'll come on to the importance of the clinical team leader role for one of our uh, quality priorities looking forward um, in next year. Uh, we still need to do some more work, particularly around um, uh, uh, having some mental health expertise into our operation centres. I think for those of you who uh, had the opportunity to see the ambulance programme on BBC One, uh, which focused on the North East for the last two series, uh, the volume of calls that come through to us um, that are dealing with patients um, that have uh, a mental health um, need and, and, and requirement and, and the need for us to be able to have the um, expertise and skills uh, to support those patients um, as best that we can. And finally, um, in order to um, improve our community engagement, uh, we've done a lot of work in this area. Um, obviously, since COVID, um, we've been getting out and about uh, more for uh, having that face-to-face -face, um, engagement again, and also working with regional partners um, 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 as well, so that we don't we, we don't have to do everything ourselves, as it were. We don't have the resources to do everything ourselves, but we can certainly um, um, su um, support others and, and, and benefit from that as well. Um, we, do, um, we do engage a lot with patients through uh, a number of different groups and have identified um, uh, where, uh, where we need to uh, improve on, on certain patient demographics um, in a plan that, that covers the next four years. Uh, what we would like to do more of is increase our patients' involvement in our service delivery and, and to have uh, patients much more involved in, 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 in how we operate as an organisation. So an example of that that occurred before COVID was when we were looking at our redesign of our ambulances and bringing the Alzheimer's Society in order to support us. We're thinking about 
how the inside of an ambulance looks and feels for patients who have uh, with, with dementia and ensure that that's the safest place that they could be. Um, and obviously that was just before COVID and that's an ambition that we would like to carry on doing um, for, you know, for our um, service development moving through for the future. So our proposed priorities for the um, uh, coming year are to um, continue to work with our system partners to reduce handover delays. Um, uh, that um, is obviously going to be quite important and key for us to um, uh, uh, recovering um, some of our response times down as well. Not all of them, but, but clearly having an ambulance that's available to, uh, to respond at hospital uh, within 30 minutes of arrival um, um, on every occasion um, is, is where our ambition uh, lies with that. Uh, but that ambition isn't something that we can necessarily achieve ourselves, um, nor can the hospitals. This is a whole systems issue that we need to look at. Part of the reason why ambulances are queuing up outside of hospitals is symptomatic of other pressures that have been felt, particularly with hospitals not being able to discharge patients to free up the beds that they need in order for the, those patients that arrive in ambulance to be able to come through. So we need to look at it in its holistic view uh, rather than necessarily saying it's one particular trust or another um, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that needs that term. Uh, improvement uh, within within all of that. Um, our second um, uh, priority that we're proposing for the next uh, for the next coming year again um, is continuing that work that we've already done done around the patient safety incident and and to look to uh, introduce uh, that framework um, that we talked about. So we've done that gap analysis. We understand what how we need to address where we are now to where we want to be. But we still need to do that, and I think that's quite quite important that we we still keep this in um, as a priority uh, for ourselves. Um, our third um, around uh, clinical effectiveness, um, we did say here that uh, we were looking at uh, this like we we're looking at several um, areas. Uh, we have actually now um, uh, chosen through some feedback that we had elsewhere that this particular um, priority is going to look at the clinical supervision of our operational workforce, that final bullet point there. Um, the reason for that is that um, there is um, evidence that has come through from the um, Healthcare and Profession Council, which is the regulatory body for paramedics, um, that has identified that the number of complaints that they get through is significantly higher for a paramedic workforce not just in the North East, but across the country, that it is proportionally for any other clinical workforce that they look at. Um, they've identified that the reason for that is what we call um, a, a lack of consistent clinical supervision that exists within that particular workforce. Um, so uh, we're very keen that we are part of that national model to improve that. There is a framework that has been out for consultation for two years that has now been implemented by NHS England uh, to support that clinical supervision of our paramedic workforce. And this is where the clinical team leaders that I talked about in our quality priority for this last financial year that's just gone is quite key and important. So they were introduced partly with this in mind, um, but it's a role that they haven't yet not been doing. And this is where we want to focus our efforts uh, in this financial year uh, to bring that role up to uh, up to full capacity, as it were, by providing our paramedic workforce with that clinical supervision from their clinical team leaders. So um, that that's the that's the priority that you'll see in the in the report that we come out for consultation um, in a couple of weeks' time. And then our final clinical priority for um, uh, for, for the coming year is, is around reinforcing that patient voice in all levels of the organisation, which I spoke about before. So it's not just re repeating the work that we did with the Alzheimer's Society, but trying to embed that into our organisation on a more sustainable level that, that, that than just having something there as a one-off. So that, uh, that's our ambition for, uh, for the coming year. And there are priorities. So, Chair, any questions? <coughs> Thank you very much and thank you for the, coming and giving the presentation. Um, 
Regarding the ambulance service, it, the reassurance seems to be that the crisis is even worse mm. elsewhere um, than here, which is obviously limited reassurance. The question, a couple of quick fire questions I have. When we get the full report, and I've asked this before, I mean, the data regarding the average response time, which is the whole area, is helpful, but you need much more detail. So, for example, and I have asked this before at least once, can we have a breakdown of geographical area? Because if, you know, the south part of the area average is two minutes, but Berwick's 40 minutes, we need to know that. And, and, and other places will need to know their own breakdown. Will we see um, stats about how many people are told when they ring up and you do hear this in different levels of seriousness, you better get a taxi or a lift from someone else because we can't get an ambulance to you in time? Will that data be on it? Will we get data about uh, deaths and serious complications caused by delays in ambulances coming? Um, to pick three important examples, I'm sure there's others, but. Can we get a proper breakdown of data so we can really see where the problems are and the geographic areas that are having a, a um, long response time? And you do, I mean, I get stories, and I know Isabel will say the same, plenty of times an ambulance will come very quickly in our area, even two ambulances, and I'd be interested if two ambulances come when there's one, do you get the double whammy on the stats of two ambulances coming quickly? That's another, uh, that's another question on the data. But you, so you, but you do get stories of over an hour. And obviously, so it doesn't happen every time, but obviously if it happens once, it can be very serious. All right, I think the question was about data, more intense data. Uh, yeah. So um, I will take that back into our organisation. Um, in terms of this particular report, uh, this report will cover um, what the Ambulance Service um, is, is commissioned to deliver, and that data and that data set that is, is within there is for an organisational wide um, uh, uh, data rather than geographical breakdown. Um, we're not commissioned or measured on that breakdown by geographical area and and therefore um, whether we can break that data down ourselves um, is something I have to go back and ask about. So, um, right, I, I'm I, happy with that. It, 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 that question's been around a long time. You know, I know, but I, I, the question's asked, so we we'll wait for the next one. Isabel, did you? Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, yes, we, often, we all get the stories of when you're on the line, find your own transport there because of the delay. Um, do you have a problem with recruitment and retention? Because, you know, every organisation gets the stage where if you've had a lot of people come in at a certain time, they're getting towards retirement, and they've all dealt with COVID very well. As well as on the handovers, I know you're, we're looking to get it resolved and reduced back to the numbers, but it... It's a bigger picture because if there's delays in the hospital, they've got to move that through the hospital to let the ambulance free. And do you get more calls because people can't get a doctor's appointment? Because if you can't get a doctor's appointment, where's your next call? Phone the ambulance service. And it might be things that the ambulance service really doesn't need to deal with, but it's still get one of your operatives having to deal with it. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, I'll try and take that in order. Um, the first one around um, around recruitment, um, we've been able to recruit very successfully. Um, uh, we over this last year, we have run um, uh, two very strong recruitment campaigns. Uh, one around um, our health advisors, so those are the people that answer the 999 and 111 calls. And, and we receive a significant amount of investment from our commissioner to increase um, to increase our workforce in that area, uh, which we've been able to do. Our recruitment uh, for uh, frontline staff um, uh, is reliant, of course, on the fact that paramedics now need a, a, a three-year university degree. Um, so we're reliant on 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 having that flow uh, through the university. I have to say that we've worked very closely with our university partners and they've supported us in increasing and, um, and, and actually sometimes going over their establishment of um, places that they have in order that we can then take on those additional staff 
that, 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 that come through. Um, that, that still doesn't negate the fact that we do have third party ambulance providers that are providing um, for us. We would like both people to be employed by us and be our staff rather than third party. And, and, and that's more of a question about um, the additional investment um, in our organisation to increase that workforce, which we've seen from our commissioners in the last year, and, and a huge amount of support for that to, uh, for that to happen, and, and hopefully for that to, uh, uh, to continue again. Um, in terms of your second question, um, uh, that was looking at handover delays. Sorry, I can't remember exactly what the question Basically, the handover delays is a bigger problem because until we can get the hospitals resolving their problems, it's a case of it's, you're going to try and reduce it, but it needs to be in hospitals. So it's not really a question on that no, one. No, it, it's a system issue, and the hospitals issue rely on, uh, re rely on discharging patients back into the community as well. So, you know, so, so, so it, it, it's a downstream issue that... Uh, that exist there. Um, in terms of um, uh, calls uh, because people can't get doctor's appointments, that's not something that we can measure, but what I can tell you, we have seen an increase in the volume of calls that we've come through. Uh, we've also seen an increase in the um, more uh, in the acuity of patients with whom we are attending. What I mean by that, uh, patients that need an ambulance of patients that are categorised as a Category 1 call or a Category 2 call um, are higher uh, than they have been and, and, and that they, they most certainly do need an ambulance. So, um, but I think that that's probably reflective of other NHS organisations have probably seen that increase as well. So um, I, I, I know that speaking with colleagues that work in primary care, how incredibly busy they are as well. So... I, 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 I can't say that people, that our pressure is related to primary care pressure because um, that's the cause and effect which I don't think is, is proven to be linked there. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor Bullman. When we come to targets, <clears throat> can I talk about Category 2 targets? Um, obviously, um, Category 1 is uh, priority. We understand that, it's life-threatening, but when it comes to Category 2, are you really making a lot of effort to bring the times down of your arrival and uh, obviously the transport of that person to wherever they need to go, to hospital or whatever? Are you really working hard on that one? You might have well done well on Category 1, but are you really trying your best in Category 2? Thank you. Um, our, our priority, first and foremost, is for those Category 1 patients. And that's the category that we have worked hardest to ring fence because of the life-threatening nature of those particular conditions. So much so that um, it's a standard that we have achieved or are very still maintained very closely to. Category 2 is, um, is a different... Um, uh, uh, issue altogether because what we found um, f for ourselves is that up to 65 70 percent of the 999 call volume that we receive now has been categorized as a two. That's not something that's unique to the North East. We've seen other ambulance trucks across the country um, uh, experience um, uh, the same trend. Um, that when the cat when the category were first um, uh, were first assessed, as it were, that category two bucket was considered to be around about forty to forty five percent. So the fact that more and more cases have gone into there has put a huge amount of pressure on ambulance services to try and achieve that, particularly when the standard there is uh, to get to those cases within forty minutes and ninety percent of occasions. So there is work that's going on. There are um, there are. Um, a couple of trucks in other parts of the country who have piloted different ways about how we manage those particular uh, categories of calls. And um, they've been, um, uh, th those have been rigorously assessed and monitored uh, to see what works well and what works best. The outcome of that work um, has had some early reporting, but it still needs a little bit more analysis to be done. But the outcome of that work will then determine which is the best route for all of us to take in order to try and bring that category 
back into um, you know back into um, um, a better response rate than we're doing at the moment. So it, it because it's now such a it, it contains such a wide range of conditions um, where it never used to. The, the issue now is how do we safely and quickly determine uh, those conditions that need a quicker response within that category for those that don't go so that is work in progress, I'm afraid. Um, a lot's changed in the last number of years. I mean, this is nothing new. We're just balancing the same plates on the same bits of stick and trying to keep them going. Although I think I do recall something about a million extra customers. Either. I'm not sure if you want to call them customers. And, and they've really coped quite well alongside the problems with the doc, you know, seeing a doctor, all, all that. So, you know, I feel sorry at times when you get a negative story in the press and it's someone who's had to wait in the Normandy or whatever. I mean, like everything, these things happen. But, you know, one, you know, you're head of comms, aren't, aren't you? And I, th I think one bad story, you know, really puts you back. Because, let's face it, we all want a fantastic service. And by the league table that we see here, we, are, we do have a fantastic service but as I said if we were sitting here 10 years ago the problems are exactly the same probably a little bit worse with the strikes and over the whatever's happening in the queue at the hospital I think that's you is that if you had to say one thing right you could fix what would it be I think sadly councillor it, it, there, there's probably more than one thing that does need to be fixed. Um, hospital handover the lane would go um, some way towards doing that. Um, I think that there are still some inefficiencies with our own organisation that we need to try and iron out. Uh, in particular, that um, as, a, as a model, we need to think about how we treat patients differently. Um, and, and that means thinking about the skill um, of our workforce to be able to either treat patients um, more at home or to be able to refer them to alternative um, uh, um, places of care uh, rather than necessarily going into an emergency department. And, and having a different skill set, I mentioned before about mental health, for example, and um, uh, we need to have more mental health uh, practitioners uh, in our control room um, and possibly um, out on the road as well in order to support those patients uh, when they need it most. Because when I was on, sorry, the, 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 one of the problems, there was so much focus on stopping the clock. You know, it was a case of who gets there first. You had people all over and it was just to stop the clock when re reality was you want, you want the right person at the right place in a reasonable time rather than this sort of, oh, the target's the important bit. If I'm lying on the roadside, I want the right people that's going to save my life or whatever. Anyway, any more? Les, you're not from Berwick, so you've got, you know. It's just a comment. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a care uh, concern about an older resident. Um, we called for an ambulance to see that gentleman. And I just want to compliment you on the care that was provided to that old man. It was absolutely astonishing. I've never seen such compassion. I've never seen such understanding. And I've never seen such professionalism on that day. And that old man was put at peace. He was in a restful mind when he... He walked onto the ambulance and went off to hospital to receive treatment. And I, I must compliment the ambulance service for that. So I'll, I'll leave that on a positive note. Right. Thank you. I cannot see any more. So we will thank Mark for this report. We have another one to come. Uh, yes, Chair, so the, our quality report we will circulate via your officer in the next couple of weeks and then that will be, that'll be available for you to read and then to feed back to us by the end of May. So hopefully we, we can have another bite at that there and those in the north of the county will be able to not be long before you have your own new hospital alongside your new leisure centre and your new school, high school. So, uh, just making a point.
<laughs> and the Moulton's it. Uh, thank you, Mark. We'll see you somewhere. Right. Item six, Northumbria Healthcare NHS Trust. Alistair, oh, quality accounts. Over to you. Floor's yours. You should have this in your papers. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, a lot of the, the background to this is the similar sort of framework to, to NIAS in that the quality accounts are currently being uh, prepared and quite a lot of the presentation is focused on the annual plan. Um, the vision, I think, has been widely shared with partners and, and we certainly do want to be one of the national leaders in providing that kind of high quality, safe, caring health care and care services. Um, the quality accounts are being con constructed as we speak um, and we'll have quite a few measures around patient safety, effectiveness and experience. Uh, and we are all, uh, as I think that the NHS and local authority are on this journey of continually trying to improve the quality of the services that we deliver. Um, we're in the process of re refreshing our five-year strategic um, plan, particularly around the clinical strategy, and we're doing that with partners, including ambulance service, primary care as well. So it's not that one that we're doing unilaterally. Uh, there is an ongoing quality strategy. Um, and uh, the quality accounts, is, uh, similar to what's been prepared, is a statutory requirement um, and will be circulated with members uh, once it's finished, which will be the end of this month. Uh, the big signals, which are, I guess, what we're sharing with staff around where we feel our priorities are, particularly around supporting our patients and our own staff, uh, a lot about retention and allowing people to grow within the organisation. Uh, there is a real focus on health inequalities, which is great and, and is really collaborative working again with colleagues in, in public health in Northumberland and local authority colleagues. Uh, a lot have been made around digital progress and continuous improvement. Uh, there are changes to estates. The, the, there is the uh, new build at Berwick, which is uh, in process, and also uh, a relocation to uh, School of Nursing and Health and Care Academy at the, the front of the Cramlington site. Um, and I think we continue hopefully, to work uh, in close collaboration with all of our partners. Um, I think if I don't want to go into this in detail, but I think it's fair to say that the Jan December and January of this year was it probably one of the hardest that I think the NHS has experienced. Um, we showed a lot of flexibility amongst our staff and how they were delivering that. Um, and it was really uh, particularly a combination of the normal winter pressures. We had the Group A strep, which throughout December, I think, decimated uh, both paediatrics and, and primary care in terms of the volumes that they saw, at really enormous volumes of children. Some quite unwell, some very anxious parents and things, and I think that it's important they got the reassurance when they needed it. Uh, COVID's down there, and that's not because COVID is now the disease that it was, but there are a lot of legislative frameworks around COVID. You still have to isolate patients. There are lots of things that are wrapping around so that once somebody is identified as COVID, uh, similarly with influenza, uh, we need to isolate them and, and, and kind of cohort them. So it creates quite a lot of logistical bits. Uh, around that and, and clearly people are often uh, unwell with with both flu and covid as well but it's not the same disease as it was pre-immunization uh, we've seen increasing numbers attending uh, urgent and emergency care throughout the year so it's, some of our attendances have been the highest that we've ever known um, and i think that's actually across the nhs so primary care has also seen its highest levels of attendances um, and I think going back to some of Mark's comments, we are seeing that acuity is rising. Some people have clearly got uh, unwell, you know, their diabetes control has got worse during COVID, et cetera. And so they're coming in not as, as fit and well as they were a couple of years ago. Uh, and sadly, we're also seeing people who probably didn't present during COVID with things like their first um, chest pain, probably had a heart attack sat at home, didn't do anything about it, and they're now coming in with a catastrophic second heart attack. Um, and these are people who I think will be a long-term legacy of, of um, COVID, not because of the illness, but because of, of what happened. Uh, we managed to be flexible with bed capacity, uh, and currently, obviously, the, there's a series of industrial actions. We've got a four-day junior doctor strike next week, which is, takes an enormous amount of planning forward to make sure that services um, are 
maintained um, and then we've still got significant activity going on to ensure that uh, waiting times for uh, planned procedures, planned outpatients and planned surgery are back towards normal. Uh, I think we're now at the best in the country, but probably not where we want to be. Uh, and the same with cancer waiting and particularly a focus on urology, which I'll talk about later. Um, so the quality accounts are a standardised um, set. Uh, they will go with the national for it. And I think it's fair to say if we send them around here again, we'll get comments from uh, the collective here. Um, and they will be ready in draft form by the end of this month. What I wanted to focus on, which is, is really the, the, the safety quality improvements um, for 22-23, and then a look to what are the ones going forwards. Real focus on ambulance handover, particularly cancer pathways, medical devices. We have a lot of different medical devices across the, the trust, and the pilot for that has been in maternity, so that we've got a reporting mechanism for those looking at medication errors, patient and then staff experience. So this is just to talk about ambulance handovers. It's, it's an interdependence with what Mark's been talking about previously. Uh, we've seen that there have been significant improvements. You can see a spike, which is the third graph on the right, uh, which corresponds to what happened in uh, December, where there were significant d delays beyond 60 minutes. But generally speaking, we've seen a downward trajectory, and that hopefully will be maintained. Uh, and that's the over 60. We've managed to keep the under 30 and the under 15 uh, to quite a good level. Um, we want to absolutely have zero tolerance for handover delays over 60 minutes and, and we know that the faster they can be, the quicker we can get crews back out onto the roads for, for uh, those in the community. Urology, um, and this is a regional issue rather than a trust specific one, um, we've got um, targets around both two week waits and actually more importantly to patients receiving um, treatment. Some of this is um, around interdependencies of the treatment. Some of this is, is patients where they want to choose the, the right time for, to start treatments and things, but clearly it is our one cancer target that we don't meet at the moment. A lot of work going on with that, and we also worked uh, in partnership with Sunderland so that certain patients are going there to Sunderland to uh, where they've got a bit of capacity to try and help with that. Medical devices in maternity, um, this is the start of an equip program, which is an IT solution that allows us to identify the bit of new equipment and every single member of staff that needs training in that. If we can get that working in maternity, we're then looking at that uh, going out across all of our other departments. As you can imagine, with technology, there are more and more medical devices coming out, and it's more important that actually we don't just launch them, but staff are familiar with them, that they get the appropriate training, and that we can document that. Previously, that was done on paper, um, and so that's a real move forward towards patient safety. Medication errors in community. Uh, we obviously have a real focus on medication errors in community. This is where... Uh, we get feedback from uh, primary care in particular um, and those uh, which have resulted in any um, either significant events or significant learning events. A lot of the time this is about communication um, and actually getting the communication right for those patients is vitally important uh, and there's been a real uh, priority on that. Patient and staff experience, you, you'll have been aware there's been quite a lot about patient and staff experience uh, both locally and in the press. I think it's fair to say we've booked the trend both in terms of patient experience, um, where we, the most recent survey we got was around a 79% patient satisfaction with the trust, um, which is came out, I think, for us the same week as the NHS as a whole had dropped to under 40%. So we're doing quite well. Our staff survey continues to do well as well. So in terms of looking forward to the seven proposed priorities for the coming year, again, as you'd expect, a real key focus ongoing on the ambulance handover delays. A second one is around Parkinson's disease, and this is for admitted patients in particular. The timing of your Parkinson's disease medication is absolutely essential to how you function on a ward. If you get it several hours late, you can freeze, you may not be able to move. So there's absolutely a real focus on that. We're using some innovative software to try and help for these patients as well so that their dosing is absolutely critical to that um, and actually how we can look at uh, the medications uh, assistant so that a standard ward 
medication review might not be when that individual gets their medication and they will need that medication um, at that certain time really just to, to, to keep their quality of life going while they're an inpatient. Uh, we want to continue to focus on the cancer care pathway, so we're 93% two-week target, 28-day faster diagnostic target, uh, and I think the, the most important one of all of those targets is those who have their first treatment by 62 days. We achieve that in a large number of specialties, but not urology. Um, the deteriorating patients is a move to better identify patients in the community with a tool called CNews, which is Community News Score. It's a case of looking at your blood pressure, your temperature, your respiratory rate, your pulse, um, and your oxygen saturations um, to allow us to see where patients are stable. Some people run with very poor levels of those, but that's normal for them. Other people deteriorate, uh, looking at how we can help that with care homes and a lot of other environments to see where somebody is actually deteriorating and it hadn't necessarily been noticed it, and you give it an objective measure of that. Um, delirium is, is, I think we've probably, in a lay term, it's kind of those bits where people are confused, often as a result of uh, infection. It can be sepsis, it can be a large number of other bits. It can also be a pre-warning of uh, a sign of cognitive decline where it presents as delirium, but there's follow-up needed when somebody's well. So we're using the pinch me tool, which seems to be uh, really well. And the aim is to audit that and make sure that we're really picking up on that. Um, the next one is really about involving people in development improvement at the trust. Um, so we've got a strategy around unpaid carers, um, a patient charter, which is new and is different from our governor. So these are patients deliberately uh, looking at widespread patient participation group, including staff in our wider community to, to kind of give uh, feedback and update on where we're going. Um, and then patient families and, and unpaid carers really uh, actively involved in how we transform out patients. There has been a uh, a lot of movement towards digital and telephone. We also know that some people need face-to-face -face and it's getting the balance right. There is no point in people having long journeys for information that could have been effectively being given over the phone, particularly for follow-up, but there's also a need for face-to-face -face and it's getting the blended right. It's not all one or all the other. We often talk about the miles left traveled and it's well over a million miles that patient journeys that are less, but I think that's also got to be balanced with the quality of the experience that people get. So we've got to make sure that people where they need to be seen are seen, but they aren't just dragged in inappropriately. Um, and the last thing is we need to look at our own staff experience. We've been looking particularly with uh, public health, freedom to speak up champions and things, because being honest, the staff are very critical. If they don't feel pride in the organisation and the care that they're giving, they let us know. Uh, and what we've seen throughout is that the staff satisfaction with the care that they're giving and patient satisfaction are intimately related. You wouldn't expect otherwise. And actually, it's a really good way of working out where there's pockets of problems and where there's strengths as well. That was it, Cam. Right. Who wants to ask a question? Isabel. Thank you, Chair. I think it's trying to do that rollout, as you say, of face-to-face -face as well as digital appointments, because that does help the, the um, mileage, the carbon footprint, but also it's the fact that people don't need to travel that far. And it's, but often, sometimes when letters come through, they don't get offered local, and we do, as Council, sort of say, phone up and ask, is this available local? because it can sometimes just be for blood or a pre-appointment. And our local in the north can do that, but it's a case of, I think it's just sometimes when the letters are coming out, they're saying, oh, Cramlinton, Newcastle, things like that. And I think it's just, you know, looking at the, the geographic of it. I completely agree. Sometimes, particularly around the cancer weights, where it's a two-week appointment, the, the, from it, it, the moment the GP refers to be seen, the priority there is about getting people seen as quite tightly as they can and, and it may be that if it's a two weekly clinic in a, in a more remote setting we have to offer them somewhere more centrally but whenever possible we need to absolutely get the appointments convenient local locations and i think digital definitely helps that but but 
the other bit is around diagnostics. I know I think we're quite lucky that we've actually got quite a lot of diagnostics out in, in more uh, rural settings as well, which really helps. I'm impressed with the technology. Now, if you have an appointment, you get a reminder with the... Have, you know, the, we, we keep on getting told that missed appointments cost a fortune. Is the use of this technology helping in that sort of field? I think the answer is yes. We, we've got a new um, whole patient system that will be linked to the NHS app called Doctor Doctor, which is going to be a patient-facing portal. They'll be able to look up when their appointments are. They'll be able to get texts and, and other information through that. So all of that will help. I think it's also fair to say from an inequalities lens, we've done quite a lot of work, for example, on, on women who need colposcopy because they're at, they're smear shown they're at high risk of cancer. And actually for hard to reach communities, particularly our deprived communities, the thing that made a difference with them was actually not a text, but actually picking up the phone and ringing them, talking through that procedure, saying this is why it's really important. And we saw a significant improvement in the DNA rates. So I think it's about the right tool for the right population, but digital is definitely helping those DNAs. Uh, another question, COVID, everybody went through some sort of you know, we were locked down and everything. It's still about, are we going to, is it going to become like the flu jab every year? Or what's the thinking? Because it seems it's gone quiet. They're just about to launch the spring boosters, which is really for very high risk groups and particularly the over 75s. My reading of the tea leaves, and Rachel and others may be able to say, is that I would imagine that we'll be after this spring booster will be in an annual cycle, probably of COVID boosters alongside flu. And ideally, if we could run both concurrently, that would be um, the best option. But I think at the moment, I think we're going to be in an annual cycle of COVID vaccinations. And can I ask what the percentage of take-up is on that? Because we all know there's a cabal who think lots of things that have gleaned off the internet that are all going to be poisoned there. You know, if when you talk to one or two of them, I mean, it's it's unbelievable, really. And I use the word unbelievable. You know, even the planes above are dropping particles that are uh, you know going to take over our bodies. What percentage is is there like it won't be vaccinated or, or the cabal that's uh, I think very anti anti vax. Well, we we had an a a population where. It was vaccination was largely open to the general population. I think going forward, it's going to be targeted along higher risk groups or an, an aged population. Um, and so I think with that, we'll find a higher uptake than if it was to the general population. Um, but I think you'd be looking at, from memory, I think you'd be looking at probably of the at-risk population, probably around about 70%. And again, it, it varies. We've got good vaccination rates, particularly with the model of delivery in Northumberland compared with the centralised delivery vehicles. Um, we did see the autumn booster, um, the, the numbers for COVID were lower than they had been on previous vaccination um, campaigns. And I, and I would, my gut feeling is that will be the case again this autumn. Um, and we'll need to see that they're just about to release the vaccines for the spring campaign. Uh, it's going to be relatively small numbers. And again, I would have thought the 70% would, for the eligible population, would probably be about right. So complacency is a problem. I think it's difficult because I think we've got this whole narrative, as you said, you've also got a narrative of the current strains of COVID combined with the vaccines are not giving anything like the morbidity and mortality that it did previously. So we've got a disease that has evolved slightly. We've got a lot of benefit from vaccination and we've probably got some benefit from people who haven't been vaccinated but have been exposed to COVID themselves but we don't know how much immunity that actually gives people long term. Okay, any Councillor Hill? Just want to ask a question, um, it might be in another report, another area but the whole huge area of procurement and value for money, is that contained in another report because that's a huge area, 
huge area of public concern and don't see any references to that. So where would that come up? wouldn't standardly be reported in the quality accounts in terms of procurement. Um, we do have an internal uh, finance committee which is run with non-execs which absolutely look internally at our procurement. Some of that will be commercially incompetent, some of it won't. But we've got an absolute focus on uh, procurement as a trust and, and as particularly given the way that, that we have subsidies and, and the structure that we've gone through. So that's looked at and I wouldn't expect that to be in the quality accounts but it is absolutely the whole of procurement within the remits of things that the trust itself procures. So it's, there's obviously national procurements for certain things as well. I mean, obviously, completely get the commercial sensitivity in the certain things that couldn't be in the, the public domain because it would not be in the public interest. I, I get that. But is there any external assurance? Is there any way we get assurance we're, of that? We, we're externally audited, so Mazars are our external auditor. So we, the, the, board, the trust board is externally audited um, on that. Uh, the FIP committee has uh, a large number of uh, non-execs on it as well. So, so I think that there is a fair amount of light that is shone on those kind of procurement bits. But it tends to be the major procurements um, which, the, the, you know, for example, the, the two new robots that we got, I mean, each of those would have been around about a million pounds. Um, so you need to look at, you're getting absolute best value for those. But it's also, can you make efficiencies on sometimes relatively cheap things, but they're high volume and that those can stack up and there is a continuous um, focus on all of that internally. We don't have any oversight on that area. No. No. Okay. I'll see any more questions, so I'll move on. Thank you very much. Please, Thank you very much. Thank you. Sustainability plan for adult social care. Thank you, Chair. Yep, over to you. Yep, thank you very much. Um, this should be relatively short uh, and punchy because I was here back in November uh, taking the uh, committee through the draft market sustainability plan, but we were required by the 27th of March to submit the final plan to DHSC, which we did, uh, and you've got a copy of that in the papers for today's meeting. I mean, I mean, obviously, the big change between the draft and the final plan is that the government themselves announced that charging reform would be delayed uh, by two years, so it's been pushed back to October 2025 at the earliest. The draft plan obviously had quite a bit in there in terms of our interpretation of how charging reform would affect Northumberland and the care markets in Northumberland. And the, the plan, uh, the market sustainability plan has been amended to focus more now on the market as it will operate without care reform actually coming in. So along a similar basis to how it does currently. Uh, as I say, the headlines I went through last time, but I will just recap quickly. The plan is split into three parts. The first part is an assessment of the, the market currently. The second part is an assessment of how we think the next couple of years will go up to 2025. And then the third part is any plans that we've got uh, or, or actions in the interim uh, to try and affect the market. Um, it's split between the care home market and the dom care market. I'll start with the care home market in section one. Uh, I think we haven't changed our view that we think broadly we have sufficient capacity within the care home market in Northumberland. That is accepting that there's pockets of geography where there's difficulties to get care at points in time. But overall, when you look at that market, uh, we do sit at any point in time with around about 200 vacancies in care homes, which would indicate that we, that we, we do have a reasonable level of capacity. But we do have difficulties with nursing care in certain parts of the geography in Northumberland, and we particularly have difficulties with dementia nursing care as well. Um, we did go out to procurement last year for a new complex dementia uh, nursing facility, and we actually had no interest at all in that from the market in Northumberland. Uh, nobody bid for it. And I think that's indicative of the difficulties there is in the market generally at the minute around workforce uh, and developing new services. Uh, we are looking to try and deliver that service just over the border at the minute, engaging with a provider just out of area. But I'll be honest, it isn't ideal that we couldn't get that moving within Northumberland. And we will look to try and get that, uh, that facility within Northumberland as soon as we possibly can. But at this point, uh, we weren't able to do it. The other key thing within the care home sector that does uh, concern us still is closures of small homes. 
uh, small care homes. We did have a problem with that through the late noughties and into the early sort of 2010 to 2017 period uh, with some homes closing. And it seemed primarily driven out by larger new builds coming in into areas and pushing those homes uh, pushing those homes to closure. We do think there's a wealth, uh, an advantage in having a number of small homes within there. I mean, it is proven that generally the quality of care within small care homes is often better than it is in, in larger care homes. And particularly with regards to our geography, it does give more choice for people uh, across Northumberland in terms of where they want to go. So we're particularly keen to continue to protect small homes as far as we can. Um, we obviously, when we submitted in uh, the autumn of last year, the, uh, the draft market sustainability plan, we just completed the fair cost of care exercise at that point. Uh, that didn't, uh, in headline, headline view, it didn't show a significant difference between what the exercise produced and what our fees were currently. Um, care North East Northumberland, uh, the representative body for some of the care homes in Northumberland, have quite strongly disagreed with the outcome of that exercise. And there has been some discussion about that. They didn't agree with a number of the adjustments that we made, but DHSC have, have, have obviously reviewed all the submissions that went in in October, and there's been no comments back from DHSC about the adjustments that we made. That were things like standardising rates of return for care homes and things like that, because we got a wide range of figures back from the individual homes when they came back through. And as well, we adjusted for things like COVID grants, providers that had to sign returns to say that COVID grants were received and used for additional costs uh, linked to the COVID pandemic. So clearly it felt appropriate to strip that out when you were looking to normalise to a period out with, out with the COVID pandemic. So, uh, but, but we do retain a slightly different view to Care North East, the representative body uh, of where that actually came out. One thing we did agree with Care North East on, and we will pick up going forward, is that they made a, a point about the inflator within the current contract, which is based on CPI, with housing. Um, they did make some, uh, so, some presentations that energy costs in particular and things like food costs are markedly higher as a proportion of the overall cost of running a care home compared to running your own home, uh, you know, uh, with an, and, and that did make sense. We're in year three of a three-year contract with the care home, so we would be due to renegotiate the contract for the next three-year period going forward, and we are going to develop those discussions with the homes around whether the contract inflator year on year does need some adjustment to take account of that. Uh, and we think that's a reasonable argument that we've put forward. And that, along with a number of other things, we'll pick up with them during those contract negotiations. The dom care market, uh, clearly the big issue there is that we don't have enough capacity in the dom care market at this point in time. I think that's fairly clear. Uh, and we think that's not really about price. Again, the fair cost of care exercise that we did for dom care wasn't wildly different to the fees that we're paying at this point in time. But the general issue in reality is that um, employment in this sector is not attractive enough at this point in time, both in terms of salary and generally, I think, perception of, of the market. In the consultation that we did with dom care providers, they came up with a number of suggestions of things that may assist the market. Uh, they're listed on page 66 of your papers. Um, I mean, that was things like the profile of and status of the work itself, guaranteed hours, uh, targeted comms to, to home care workers who've left the market to try and attract them back in. We will, uh, we will look to pick all of those up, all of those things that have been put forward by the dom care market. Uh, and we were waiting for the guidance on the grant streams that, uh, that, that are going to come in for this year to assist us with this area uh, before we went forward with that. Uh, that guidance did come out on Friday, so officers are at the minute assessing uh, where that leaves us in terms of how we can use 3.5 million of additional funds that Northumberland's been given for 23-24 to, to assist in, in sustaining the market and stabilising the market. Uh, section two of the uh, market sustainability plan uh, really repeats the themes that I've already mentioned. So this is the period up to 2025 and what our concerns are. And again, it's, it's more closures of small care homes would be something that we would we'd be concerned about. We are worried about nursing care, if I'm honest. I mean, I think there's pressure on uh, nursing capacity and the workforce generally because the NHS needs nurses, we need nurses, everybody needs nurses at the minute, and there isn't enough of them coming through the system. So we are having conversations with the ICB about that. The local authority doesn't formally have statutory responsibility for delivering nursing care, so that has to be joint work between ourselves and the ICB in terms of how we, how we manage that. We don't actually pay for nursing care within nursing homes that is paid for by the ICB, not the local authority, so we have to work together. Uh, and workforce capacity was the other main concern there. And then section three around plans. Um, 
I mean, certainly in terms of the care home market, I mean, one of the big things in the medium to long term for us will be to grow our use of extra care and supported housing. Uh, I mean, I think generally uh, we don't see traditional residential care as being the most attractive model going forward. People want more independence, they want more flexibility in how they live. Uh, I think there will always be a need for the acute level of nursing care and perhaps some provision for residential care. But many authorities around the country who are a bit ahead of the curve on us here have already invested heavily in extra care and are moving away from residential accommodation uh, as a solution going forward. And we want to look at that to a greater degree. Um, although the fair cost of care model didn't produce fees, fee levels that were significantly different to what we're paying in Northumberland at the minute, we do recognise the the problems that face the economy at the minute, the problems that face us all as households, and the problems that are facing care homes around energy costs, high levels of inflation, etc. And we do think there's a need for perhaps some short-term intervention using the grant stream that I was talking about before, some time-limited support. I mean, I think energy costs in particular, I mean, anybody who's been looking at the press over the last week, I mean, I saw an article in the news about five days ago that claimed that they thought energy costs would drop by 20% by the late summer. And only yesterday I saw again that we expect energy costs to uh, oil prices to rocket upwards in the next few days. So it really, we don't have a clue at this point which way it's going, which is why I think time limited support is more appropriate uh, for us to increase fees significantly at this point on something that may then drop by 20% in cost in a few months' time isn't very responsible commission for us going forward when we're trying to make the best use of those funds. I think particularly as well, uh, I mean, our biggest worry is Dom Care, so we will have to be looking at how we support that market going forward. Um, there isn't an easy solution to this. I mean, we have already increased wage rates in conjunction with providers up to the real living wage. We've increased mileage rates for uh, reimbursement for the travel that our carers do, which particularly helps the rural areas. We've run a lot of campaigns um, around raising the profile of care, job fairs. We're working with DWP and others. Um, but we, we need to continue to look at what else we can do in that area. We are exploring a model of a care academy in Northumberland, which has been used in one or two other authorities regionally. But the, the, the jury's out on that one at the minute as to how much benefit we think we'd get for the investment on it. And clearly the government's pushing immigration potentially as well as a solution when you haven't got enough workforce. We've got to look somewhere for that workforce. So we're um, talking to a few providers about potential pilots in that area. Um, Extra care is the other obvious thing as well, which will support the DOM, even though we think it's the right direction of travel for residential care, can support the DOM care market significantly as well, because it gives you a satellite uh, platform to deliver DOM care out from if you've got an extra care establishment. And also we would hope people, particularly in very rural areas who are starting to struggle to cope, may be attracted to an extra care facility within that more rural geographic area and want to come in and that makes it easier. If we can get people together, it makes it easier to cohort the support that we need to get to them uh, and more effective to use the staff involved. And lastly, just personal budgets. We're really looking, uh, uh, we've got a project set away on looking at personal budgets and whether we're getting the best out of that in Northumberland. We're having a look at models of good practice from elsewhere in the country and kind of micro commissioning uh, and micro providers for personal budgets as well and carers. Uh, because really that can be a solution. So people might not be attracted to work within the care market, but they might be happy to work for somebody down the road who they know quite well uh, and be employed as a carer for their views and personal budget. So uh, again, we're just looking to make sure that we, we're getting the most out of that. One last thing is that we uh, know from the guidance that came out at the end of last week that we now have to submit a plan by the end of May on how we're going to use the grant uh, that's been allocated for this year. Uh, there's a little bit of frustration there. Again, the guidance has come out at the beginning of at the end of March, beginning of April, with a very short deadline for us to turn around. And we have said to the government on numerous occasions, we're rushing these decisions in terms of what we're doing. It would have been good to get the guidance back in December. So we had a nice long run in to talk to providers about it. But we are where we are again, and we'll make sure we try and use the money to the, to the best ability that we can to make sure that the market's as safe as it can be in Northumberland. And, and we try and close that gap between how many people need Dom care in particular, and our ability to meet that need. Thank you, Chair. Look at what the recommendations we have to do. Derry. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, a comment on page 64 near the bottom. I think there's a word missing. Uh, it's just above the final paragraph. Section three of the plan, how have used. Ah. 
Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll get that amended. And I think it's how we as an authority have to work with planning, because again, it's getting the right developments in the right locations, rather than just building residential homes. It's getting, yeah. can I say, the 21st century, 22nd century uh, type of living for these people in the future. We've got to think of the future. Yeah. So you're suggesting that planning isn't working well enough with... I'm not saying it's not working well enough. I think it's th thinking what's the right development to provide to cover the needs of the people it needs. I, I think that's I, I, what we've got to look I'm, at. I'm with you. It's just to the mechanics that one department maybe doesn't communicate. Um, anybody else, Blaise? Uh, I understand that recently a care company went out of business and that caused uh, a lot of problems in the, in the provision of services. Um, have you overcome that issue? And uh, is there anything in this document that, um, well, I can't see anything, but have you thought of putting in like a, a plan for what if scenario? Yeah, I, I mean, we had a, a major dom care provider um, hand back their contract as opposed to go out of business. And I think it was around about 2017 was the last large scale hand back that we have. And I, I, I wouldn't exaggerate that that was really difficult to manage. Uh, and we did engage with one of the other large providers within Northumberland to pick up chunks of that work. And it did cause real problems for them in terms of trying to support it. So that is a risk that we're at and we are looking at contingency arrangements about how we manage that risk. Uh, I mean, clearly the ultimate uh, option is that we could take things back in house uh, as a council if we had a failure in the market. That would be a very expensive option for the council though, obviously the terms and conditions generally that are offered around pension and things like that. I mean, it, that is, whether we agree with it or not, it's one of the reasons why it sits in the private sector. Uh, generally that the cost is lower within that area so there would be a bill that, that accompanies that but we are having a look at the minute at other options I wouldn't want to talk about those too early and they'll come through natural process about how we handle it since that one there have been about five or six smaller providers that have handed back either parts of or business but I mean it's been relatively small scale and that's been quite easy to pick up uh, amongst the, you know the 40 to 50 providers that we have spread across Northumberland who were still maintaining care provision at that point in time uh, within residential care, uh, we haven't really had any significant uh, closures over that, that period. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, we have had recently one or two homes either deregister or talk about deregister for registering for nursing care uh, and go to residential only, which comes back to that point that I'm making about the difficulties of employing nurses at the minute, trying to find cover for nursing shifts, etc. And again, we're, we're talking to the ICB about that and how we can try and stabilise it. I mean, at the end of the day, there are a lot of nurses in Northumberland generally, but at the minute we compartmentalise them between different parts and different sectors. And the question is, can we try and move the resource around a little bit to get some safety and, and cover in that? So. Terry, thank you. Amy? Terry, did you want to? Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, and especially, it's really good to hear the continued um, focus on domiciliary care, because um, as you know, that is a concern that yeah. people have raised through Health Watch. Um, I think the other issue that we've we're, we've been hearing about recently, as well through our care home forum, is that of respite care. And I just wondered where that sits within um, your market sustainability, because does that go across all of the strands you're talking about, or does it sit in the the res care? part of it yeah i mean it, it respite can be offered in a number of different ways yeah. so it will spread across i mean the, the primary focus in terms of what the market sustainability plan requires us to deliver is around care homes and around domiciliary care which is why it isn't raised explicitly but it is something that we're cognizant of again generally because we have quite a lot of spare capacity within the care home market respite care doesn't tend to be a huge issue for us again there'd be nubs in localities you know if somebody lives in Kielder or whatever, and they want respite relatively close to, to that area, it can be difficult to get something exactly for their needs. But it's generally not a problem for us to meet that need overall within Northumberland. Um, and as I say, there's not really a fees issue in relation to that or, or any sort of sustainability issue. So is it more of a logistical issue about getting the right care 
for, for the, the right, right person at the right time because I think that's one of the issues that we hear it's about that how close to the wire you get if the carer is looking for that respite. That's right. There's yeah. an interesting model in Durham that we're just having a look at as well. We, we are quite well advanced in Northumberland around the use of shared lives, but we use it predominantly with the learning disability client groups. Some other local authorities have got, uh, just for anybody who isn't aware, shared lives is in estrogen fostering for adults. So you go and live with a family rather than living in a home or whatever. Um, some other areas around the country, and one or two in the region, have looked more widely than just the learning disability client group and are starting to offer shared lives for older people. And Durham, we think, have been particularly successful with the respite scheme linked to shared lives. So we're just having a little look at that and seeing whether that might be an option for us. To, because we're already advanced in shares, shared lives generally, we've got a good platform to launch from in Northumberland and we're ahead of some of the others. Can I ask about your two or three things before I get to what we've got to do? Um, do we need a closer look into care home closures and the DOM provider? I mean, care home... Uh, yeah, you know, are, are we nearly at the point where we've got to say, as a scrutiny committee, we, we recognise there's a potential problem, or, or are we OK? Right, so I, I think two different things there. I mean, with, with care homes, we have a, a, a you know, a, a representative organisation that are telling us that, in their view, fee levels are too low in Northumberland for care homes. They're all seeing that. And, and from our point of view, we watch this really carefully because what we don't want to get is to a crisis point with it. Um, but our view still at this point is we're not hearing significant noise from that sector. We're not seeing any indications that there is a significant problem. You know, that there are homes still changing hands at this point. They are being bought as going concerns despite, or not say despite, having regard to Northumberland's fee rates, you know, it's despite, I think, in terms of, uh, of some voices that we hear. We've had a new build in Annick within the last few years that actually opened during COVID, so we've had additional capacity into the market. So the, mar the care home market is not screaming problem at us at the minute, although that isn't what we hear from the association, as I say, which is why we've got to be really careful with that. The dom care market is a very different uh, thing, though. The dom care market, there clearly is a problem at the minute here in Northumberland. There is a clear is a problem in most local authorities at the minute across the region and across the country, and we can't get enough workers to work in the dom care market. What we do know from the work that we've done with providers is I don't think that's fundamentally a fee-level problem. Providers are not run into bankruptcy or whatever. If, if providers are considering leaving the market, it's the sheer stress of trying to run a dom care business and the difficulties in trying to get staff to work in that dom care business. So I think we have a bigger national issue. So if I say to Councillor Veronica Jones as chairman and mm -hmm. Chris is the scrutiny officer, that could be where we look for a deeper, deeper dive, would that be the right word? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll hand that to her because this is her yeah, committee. Yeah. But I, 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 just, care, I just get yeah. the feeling yeah. that... that and you use the word get ahead of the curve or upstream. Yeah. I'll leave that with her, but that, that's my suggestion at the minute. Would that agree? I'll second that, Chair. Yeah. Right, that's, that's for the minutes, Chris. So it'll be picked up in the next meeting that we hopefully might have a deeper look into where the problem are, the problems are, yeah. which is that one. Right. Um, and I go back to your planning and rural you did mention rural care homes and or whatever and uh, time is it <laughs> um, i do think that there, there is a problem in rural areas but there is also a problem of large properties that are sitting derelict now i don't know if an old property done up is cheaper than a new build because a new build in the countryside might be a problematic time bomb because, you know, everywhere is sewn up with the National Park, Hadrian's Wall, or anything. Uh, the one that came to my, my mind, you probably don't know it, but the National Trust have had a building sitting empty at Scott's Gap. Huge one. It used to be the headquarters. It's massive. And it's just sitting. It's been empty for 10 years. And I think, what could happen? What could do? What? You know, and these are, these are sort of quite remote areas that do have a population. And I just wonder at times whether we, we need to use our knowledge at suggesting buildings that might be of use. I'm, not, I'm just putting that in. But I'll go back to the script of here, which is on the front page. You know, Cabinet is recommended, this is what we've got to think about now, to approve the draft market sustainability plan included as an apex to this report and submission for the Department of Health and Social Care. Are we happy with that? 
and the next one to authorise the executive director of all adults ageing and wellbeing in consultation it's all there in front of you are we happy with that or do we want to add anything to that if i could just come back in on that one chair that was primarily about if any late comments came in from the consultation with providers that we could just tweak the plan off the back of that so that, in essence, has already passed that well, one anyway. So well, we, we've indeed. had a suggestion of, of a deeper delve into DOM. Yep. yep. Uh, I'll leave that for the Chairman and Chris to, to work out, but that's the, the wish of here to have it. That could be separate from here, but I think if there is a problem, let's get in front of it. So are we, anybody else, before I close this part and say, are we, Les, I thought you were indicating. Yes, sorry, Chair, but uh, can we add on what I talked about earlier? Uh, a what-if plan. We should see in this document uh, some ideas if things start to fall apart and uh, what the plan would be, how uh, we as a local authority would step in. There, there's, no there's no plan, as it were, within this document that says if it falls apart in this sector... Do you this want the safety net here? Are you happy with that, that, that? More than happy to come back with that. It, it would never have been part of this report because this report was predicated around the government wanting reassurance as to how the funding was being used that they were supplying to sustain the market. In terms of internal planning, though, uh, Councillor, I completely agree that we would want to be ready for that eventuality. As I think I've hinted at verbally in here, the ultimate fallback plan is we would bring something in-house if we needed to, if all else failed. Our first option tends to be to align with another provider to see whether they're pred or multiple providers to see if they'll pick it up. But the cases are often needing to be judged on their merits as they, unhappen, as they happen depending on where the geography is, the size and scale of what's happening. As I say, we've had five very small providers step out of the market in the last couple of years. They've been relatively easy to manage, though, so you don't need a big contingency plan for it. But I'm absolutely happy to put something down to reassure the committee that we, we, we have a process in place that we would go through to, to manage that situation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Are we happy to move on with this? Are we happy? Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, move on to... You're welcome to stay, Neil, but if, if you wanted... Right. Item 8. Health and Wellbeing Work Programme. Chris. Pages 73 to 78. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's just say at the next meeting we'll have um, CNTW and Northern no Newcastle Hospitals quality accounts, much like we had today, but for those two trusts. Um, I'll take away the suggestion of looking further into the risk of DOM care, and I'll speak to Councillor Jones about that, as well as speak to Neil about a report on assurances on what we can do if there's any um, failures within the sector. Okay, um Anybody from the floor? I see nobody. Right, we'll move on to the next one, uh, which is urgent business. I have none. No one looks like urgent business type people here. So, date of next meeting, 2nd of May, 1 o'clock. Thank you for your attendance. <laughs>